Okay, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you all for attending this uh, Biochemistry in Focus uh, webinar. Um, uh, my name is Colin Bingle. I'm Professor of Respiratory Cell and Molecular Biology at the University of Sheffield, and I'm also uh, Chairman of the uh, Biochemical Society Awards Committee. And it's really in that capacity that I'm here today introducing our speaker, uh, uh, Sarah Teichman, who is going to be talking about uh, the human cell atlas mapping the human body one cell at a time. So Sarah is the recipient of uh, the 2020 GSK uh, Award from the Biochemical Society, and this is given in recognition of research uh, um, leading to new advances in medical sciences. And I'm sure as we go through the seminar today, you will get a good indication of the way in which Sarah's work has led to significant advances, and some of the work that she'll be talking about today is, is highly topical. Um, I should also mention that Sarah is a previous, previous recipient of a Biochemical Society Award. She won the 2011 Colworth Medal, um, and I was lucky enough to be in the audience when she gave her presentation at the Royal Society, which was part of the uh, Biochemical Society's centenary celebration. So a very impressive talk we had there, and I'm sure we're going to get another one today. So, so Sarah is Head of uh, Cellular Genetics at the Wellcome uh, Sanger Centre. And uh, she is working on a complex deciphering of immune systems using genomics and bioinformatic approaches. And she's also the co-lead of the Human Cell Atlas uh, project, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, and this was launched in 2016. And the approach that the Human Cell Atlas is taking is to uh, map transcriptional uh, uh, expression signatures across each individual cell in the human body. Uh, and what you will see today is how this has been applied in the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so she's going to be presenting uh, her, her work over the next 40 minutes or so. And what I would say is that if you have questions, and we certainly want to encourage you to ask questions, then please can you do that using the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel so that you will be able to um, ask those questions. Those questions will be fed to me uh, online uh, during the, the process of the talk, but at the end then we will ask those questions. We will hopefully have around 15 minutes for uh, Sarah to answer those questions. She has an incredibly busy diary and I think we probably will finish pretty much on three o'clock. Uh, so with that, I think we're ready to go, and I would like to hand you over to Sarah to give her presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin, for that kind introduction, and thank you to Colin, uh, to the Biochemistry Society, and to GSK for this wonderful award. It's a tremendous honour for me to present here. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is the human body, one cell at a time. That's what my research is about. And um, of course, each of you has a body that consists of a fantastic diversity of cells that come together in different ways in different organs. And in the different tissues in our body, you can see the airways, the thymus, the heart kind of represented here. The body has many different types of cells with different shapes and functions. Every cell contains the same DNA, pretty much. Our genome remains identical. So why is each cell different? There's an invisible machinery that determines which genes are active in each cell. And those different sets of active genes result in the specific shapes and features of the cells. And that's why we have fibroblasts on, on the left-hand side, but also neurons as shown on the right-hand side. Historically, uh, we've used microscopy mainly to look at cells, and that told us that they have different shapes. Now we can understand why they're different. So by around 2013, the resolution revolution in genomics was underway, with cutting-edge technology making it possible to sequence the tiny quantities of nucleic acid in individual cells. And single cell RNA sequencing enables us to quantify exactly which genes are switched on in each individual cell. So the Human Cell Atlas Consortium was really motivated and catalyzed by that resolution revolution in genomics. And what we set out to, to map are the types and properties of all human cells 
as a basis for both understanding, so a basic science mission, but also diagnosing, monitoring and treating health and disease. And that's where that the medical impact comes in that Colin mentioned that's related to this GSK award and that I want to emphasize in this particular presentation. When I had the opportunity to take on the leadership of the cellular genetics program at the Wellcome Sanger Institute in 2016, my ambition was to leverage single cell genomics to map the human body. And my partner in that endeavor became Aviv Rege from the Broad Institute in Boston, who shared this vision. And she coined the term human cell atlas for that, that aim. Over the past four years, the Human Cell Atlas has taken on a global membership that's constantly growing. And I want to emphasize that it, this is an open, bottom-up, grassroots, scientist-led community that you can join. We have almost 2,000 members, as you can see, from countries all over the globe, over 1,000 different institutions. And um, you can every scientist can join as an individual member or register their research project at humancellatlas.org slash join HCA. What's important to our community is not just um, the what we do, but also the how we do things. And to that end, um, to, uh, we've, we've formed an equity and diversity working group as, as part of the project. And it's led by Alex Shailik, Partha Majumdar, Musam Langa. Um, and for the, the how we do things, we form biological networks um, as well as the early working groups that are focused on analysis methods, the computational analysis methods that are at the heart of the project and, and uh, standards and technologies working group and metadata working group. And these biological networks are um, communities of scientists that focus on the individual tissues and organs that our body is composed of. And so we have about 12 now. Um, that co cover many of the major systems and major tissues. So there are about 50 tissues in the body organized into 14 organ systems. And we also have working groups for human development, embryonic and fetal development, organoids, and genetic diversity. And you can, you can contact the coordinators of the, each of these working groups at humancellatlas.org slash coordinators. So the technologies, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, are really what catalyzed uh, and, and galvanized the community, I think, um, around this project uh, at, at the beginning. And it was really this evolution from conventional bulk genomics, which is the, the shape here, to single cell genomics um, early on, and now more recently, spatial transcriptomics which is putting the pieces of the cake back together in two and three dimensions in tissues. And it's the combination of these methods um, integrated through computational statistical methods um, that, that is going to build our human cell atlas. Now, uh, I just I want to show you one little movie here. I think I've got a couple of movies uh, in my presentation, um, if, if this works which shows using microfluidic chip technology, which was one of the, the, the early scaling uh, of cells, how cells are captured in individual chambers in microfluidic chips. So this is one of the ways that cells can be captured. Other ways are the more common now are the microfluidic droplets, nano well plates, uh, and, and uh, multiplex barcoding methods um, in split-seq approaches. But you can see here that the, the, the principle is that cells are isolated and, and um, barcoded individually so that the, the nucleic acid that's released inside each individual cell can be tracked to the origin of that cell. And, and um, in this movie uh, from, from Fludum, you can see how the, uh, the RNA is released through cell lysis. Then it goes on to amplification and library prep and sequencing and of course, computational analysis downstream. And, and it's through the, the single cell genomics as well as the spatial methods that we want to build this Google map eventually and get to the definition of individual cells in, inside the tissues in their uh, microenvironments, in their niches and um, define the, the 
individual cell circuits, the individual um, cell neighborhoods uh, that, that are uh, occurring in our tissues. And so that's really the, the vision, the principle of the human cell atlas. Now, this is the, the GSK talk of the Biochemical Society, um, which is for advances in medical sciences. And so uh, a, a logical question is, what is the impact of having such a reference map? Um, what's the meaning basically for medicine? And there are lots of different implications that, that having a reference map has. One is that it can provide um, that, that framework for understanding what goes awry in disease, what changes in disease, and in order to understand those changes, you need to have a healthy reference in the first place. It can provide a framework for drug discovery, and I'll show you maybe some examples later that show how, how mapping the endometrium, the, the uterus, basically opens up options um, and, and fields of drug discovery in unexpected areas. Understanding drug toxicities by knowing where, uh, com in a comprehensive way, a particular gene is expressed all over the body in all the different tissues. Um, rare disease variants, diagnostics, and regenerative biology. And um, in, in this talk, I'll focus in particular on the regenerative biology, the organoid models, tissue engineering, in other words, and on disease mechanisms. So where do we stand in terms of how far we've gotten uh, in terms of uh, atlasing data and single cell data points in this project? Um, if you go to uh, the, the data coordination platform at human, data.humancellatlas.org, that you'll find about 5 million cells in total. And here are examples of different tissues, the kidney, the skin, the lung, the gut, where there are almost one and a half million cells from, from over a hundred different human individuals and, and many hundreds of samples. Embryonic and fetal development, of course, that encompasses many different tissues. And, and that in itself encompasses data uh, uh, with more than four million cells, of course, spread across different developmental time points. The liver is starting to be mapped, even though it's a challenging tissue to handle. And, um, and so this, this gives you an idea of how we're building up the human body step by step um, through our biological networks by focusing on these different um, organs and, and, and their tissues. And so what I'd like to go on to in this first uh, vignette of three that I'll tell you about today is uh, our unpublished ongoing work on the cell atlas of the human uterus. And this is work uh, led by Rosa Bento, who used to be a postdoc in my group and now is a, a junior group leader at the, at the Sanger Institute, uh, together with another rising star, Margarita Turco, from the pathology department at, at the University of Cambridge, together with my own group. And, and uh, in a broader collaboration, including also Omar Barakter and Ashley Moffitt's group. Now, the, the human uterus has, um, is a challenging tissue to study because of the, the dynamics of the changes in the tissue throughout the monthly cycle. So you've got the shedding uh, occurring during the, the initial phase, the menses. Then there's a proliferative phase where the cells are cycling and dividing to rebuild the mucosal lining of the uterus, the endometrium. And then a secretory phase where the cells produce secretions, the epithelial cells produce secretions uh, that provide nutrients for the embryo, and that's the window of implantation at the beginning of pregnancy. And um, a lot of the features of this tissue are specific to primates, so including the spiral arteries that, that um, uh, are part of the, the structure of the endometrium. And um, so together with the dynamic changes and the primate-specific features of the tissue, it's been, uh, it hasn't been a tremendously accessible for molecular and cellular studies. And so uh, therefore using a cell atlas approach, so a combination of single cell and single nuclear RNA sequencing together with using spatial transcriptomic mapping, which you can see um, in the, three the two panels at the bottom and on the right hand side of this slide, has really opened up a window of, of new knowledge about the cells and their locations in the endometrium. 
Now, starting uh, uh, at the top left here, if you can see the red laser pointer, um, I just want to explain very quickly that the myometrium is the, the smooth muscle layer that surrounds the uterus, and that's where you can see at the bottom. And then the endometrium itself consists of three different layers. The basal layer, which is um, the location that it's thought where, where the stem cells reside, although that's, that's, I would say, still an open question. Um, the glandular layer in, in, in the middle, and then the luminal um, layer at the top towards the inside of the uterus. Um, and so what we, what we need to, to have is tissue samples from these different stages. And um, um, uh, uh, traversing the full depth of these different layers. And you can imagine that getting human tissue samples, uh, it can be challenging because people don't voluntarily sort of give up their tissues. And so the, um, the sources of these samples have been biopsies from um, people who are having biopsies for diagnostic purposes and then end up being, uh, they end up being healthy biopsies and also tissue from deceased transplant donor uh, tissue from the Cambridge Bar Repository for Translational Medicine, uh, transplant surgeon course, side parsi and colleagues whom we work with closely. And, um, and these biopsies are very precious because they, trans tra they traverse the full depth of the tissue, whereas the biopsies are the two, one or two top millimeters of the tissue on the inside of the uterus. And, um, but the biopsies can cover more different stages in a more dense way than the deceased transplant donor tissue, which is rare and precious, or all the tissue is precious, but the, the transplant donors are uh, particularly, the female tra deceased transplant donors are particularly rare. Um, so what, what we did here was to take these samples and, as I've mentioned, subject them to, to single cell and single nuclear sequencing, as well as spatial transcriptomic analysis, and what that is are uh, tissue sections uh, on, on chips, which are 10x genomics visium chips. And you can see here each uh, sequenced feature of the chip is, is, is shown as a circle um, on top of the, the, the tissue section. And it's about 50 microns in diameter. So it con consists of more than one cell. Uh, and it consists of, of up to, to 20 or even 40 cells, depending on the, the exact architecture of the tissue. And we can deconvolve, we can deconvolve uh, and predict the cells in each individual feature um, by integrating with the, um, the single cell data. And we use uh, a framework that's unpublished, on, it's on GitHub by Vitaly Klevchepnikov from Omar Bar Actors Group called Cell2 Location. And what that allows us to do is to um, locate where individual uh, cell populations are sitting throughout the, um, the depth of the tissue sections. And so uh, what this is showing is, is on the top right markers for glandular epithelial cells. So what we can see is that they're, uh, they're sitting in these little, the glandular epithelial cells are sitting in little clusters around the glands, um, uh, at which we can identify in terms of their full transcriptomic signature and multiple subtypes of these epithelial cells that I won't go into here in detail. We can also identify different stromal cell populations. These are these are essentially structural cells that form kind of some of the, the 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 strength and structure of our tissues, and we can identify different subtypes of these fibroblasts, these stromal cells. And what you're seeing here is is a so-called decidual stromal cell population that we also observe in the decidua, which is the the pregnant version of the endometrium, uh, and where we published a cell atlas. Uh, on this, the decidua, a couple of years ago in, in Nature, Rose Orvento again was the first author, and we can see that that, that fibroblast population in the endometrium in the luteal phase sits in the top layer uh, here, whereas a different fibroblast population that's specific to the basal layer you can see sitting in the bottom left. And why is it important to understand the nature of these different stromal cell populations? It's because they're secreting different signals and those signals um, are determine the, the cell fate of the epithelial cells. And so there's a, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. On the bottom right, we can see that there are ciliated epithelial cells that line the lumen that sit on top. And, and we can, the, the dark red color uh, uh, pops up 
on the luminal layer because what we're highlighting there is markers of that particular cell population which has the cilia, the hairs that move secretions along the uterus and, and um, what we can also see is that there's an LGR5 positive cell population that's also sitting in that luminal layer of the endometrium in the, in the luteal phase, in the, in the secretory phase, um, which we think is, a, is an intermediate progenitor population. So the stem cells are unlikely to be sitting in that top layer, but we think these LGR5 cells are intermediate uh, proliferating um, progenitor cells. Now, I showed you that spatial transcriptomics data, which, is, which may seem coarse grain, but it's incredibly valuable and exciting in the sense that it's comprehensive in, in terms of the genes that it covers. And so it really, it's, it's really an unbiased mapping of um, the, the expression pattern across the tissue in that two-dimensional tissue section. We can look up every single marker like that LGR5 that I showed you, or the markers of ciliated cells and so on in the data and find out where the cells are sitting. But to really map them at single cell resolution, we need to go back to good old microscopy. And um, this is a very fancy multiplex fish approach here from, from Omar Bayraktar's lab, um, who's a, a brilliant technology development PI in my program. And uh, they've developed a quantitative multiplex fish high throughput platform for mapping really large tissue sections. So kind of taking us to that Google Maps view of tissue sections. And what's what's mapped at the same time here is DAPI for the nuclei, FCAM for epithelial cells, a matrix metalloprotease marker, and PAEP, which the glandular epithelial uh, cells express the, sec the secretory epithelial cells. And um, in each of the, of the columns, you can see different phases of the menstrual cycle, so proliferative, um, mid and late, and then the secretory phase, mid and late. And um, what these beautiful images show us is the, the, the development of the glands and the, uh, uh, so in the, in the early proliferative phase, there are very rare glands that are quite isolated, expressing MMP7 and PAP with the with the EPCAM marker in terms of those glandular epithelial cells. And then you see a massive rise in expression in mid and late proliferative phase. And by the secretory phase, those glands are um, sort of mature and well-formed. And the PAEP expression is, is really high in the upper glands. And, and MMP7 draws back to the deeper glands. Um, and the PAEP is dominating in the mid-secretory phase and the majority of, of the epithelia and the MMP7 matrix metalloprotease is restricting back. And, um, and finally, we have, we have MMP7 expression in the lumen um, getting ready for, for menstruation. And so, so you can see from this imaging and we can quantify each gland in terms of the expression levels of these or other markers in a very quantitative way um, you can see how this gives us exquisite resolution. Um, and if we if we integrate this data with the spatial transcriptomics data, then um, we we get the best of both worlds with the benefit of the high resolution as well as the unbiased mapping of all transcripts. So that's it's it's what I want to highlight here is really how the the combination of single cell genomics with spatial transcriptomics with um, multiplex imaging can get us towards the Google Maps of the human body, in this case of the, the uterus throughout the menstrual cycle. Now, what I said I want to emphasize in this talk is the, the utility of the human cell atlas for, um, in, in the context of different applications, engineering of tissues and, and disease. And um, for, the, for, the, for this example of the uterus, uh, the the um, the mapping itself I want to emphasize has a, has a lot of implications for disease because we can integrate with GWAS uh, associations for endometriosis and um, um, uh, endometrial cancer and so on and so forth and start to identify new drug targets. But I don't want to go into that in detail here. Instead, I want to show you how um, we can use endometrial organoids, which were developed by Margarita Turco and, and published in Nature last year to um, understand the cell fate decisions uh, of the epithelial cells in more detail. So endometrial organoids uh, are, in, in this context, they're adult stem cell derived. So basically they're derived from a tissue sample that's digested and then 
grown in matrigel and, and passaged uh, over a couple of weeks. And um, um, the, the idea here is that we want to um, connect the in vivo cell atlas of the uterus with the single cell transcriptomics data of the in vitro models. In this case, they're, they're stem cell derived organoids, um, but the same principle could hold for IPS derived cells or organoids. And then, sorry, see whether we can use the, the in vivo human cell atlas data to improve in vitro systems, but also the engineering of the in vitro system helps us understand um, mechanisms and, and regulatory pathways in the that, that are occurring in our adult tissues or in our in our homeostatic healthy tissues. So you can think you can in a way think of the the human cell atlas as providing the ingredients or the recipe. It's like a recipe cookbook. Um, for making tissues in vitro. So the human cell atlas tells us about cell surface receptors, secreted factors, and, 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 uh, uh, and ligands for the cell surface receptors. It tells us about the cell culture medium, therefore. So what are the secreted factors that these cells are living in, in vivo? Um, what's the kind of uh, um, matrix, depending on the tissue, not, not relevant for the uterus, but for other tissues, there are scaffolds that the cells are growing, growing on. And so in a way, you can think of the, 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 the um, in vivo cell atlas as, um, as providing an initial set of instructions for how to grow tissues in the dish and, and send different signals to the epithelial cells and, and mature them down different lineages. And then um, what we did was show that we can re recapitulate that in the dish and make, make on the one hand organoids that are dominated by ciliated cells and they have a kind of twisted morphological appearance and um, we can show by single cell RNA sequencing that they're going down one lineage and by using notch signaling we can push the organoids down the secretory lineage and show that they, they uh, recapitulate glandular epithelial cells with that more columnar morphological structure. So we can, we can engineer the culture, we can engineer the cells in vitro based on the recipe book that the human cell atlas data gives us. And um, so that's the, the, one of the, the medical or, or um, translational applications of the human cell atlas is, is towards regenerative biology and, and in vitro systems. Now, um, in, in terms of uh, medical applications of the, the the uterine system i mentioned that a couple of years ago we studied the decidua which is that the decidualized version of the endometrium so to speak which is uh, uh the uh the the next phase of the endometrium after the embryo implants and um when we when we studied that those tissues in detail what we could see is is what we could find is is different natural killer cell subsets on the maternal side um, that are uh, talking to, that are signaling to, or in, in a signaling relationship with fetal extravillus trophoblast. So these are the cells outside the embryo that come from the fetus and have the paternal alleles. So basically the maternal immune system, these uh, NK cell populations are seeing paternal alleles. And of course, this is a kind of conundrum for the immune system because uh, in a normal context, uh, the, the T cells and NK cells and so on would recognize non-self alleles. So um, basically that's the principle of, of, of the challenge of transplantation. It's what should happen for clearing tumors, basically in somatic mutations. But here there's a context where the immune system needs to tolerate those paternal antigens. And what we were able to uh, identify is the, the immunosuppressive and adaptive innate and, and uh, adaptive uh, cell signaling uh, complexes that contribute to that immunotoler immunomodulation and, and the, the peaceful kind of uh, inflammatory yet peaceful environment that occurs at the maternal fetal interface. And so this has implications for um, reproductive medicine and reproductive bi uh, biology, as, as well as other contexts, tumor tolerance, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so on um, by, by opening up the cellular and, and molecular mechanisms that are occurring in the human 
on text, which is quite different from the mouse, I should say. Another disease context that I want to um, touch on, on briefly um, and, and that, that uh, funnily enough, also relates to a, a collaboration with GSK is um, the Cell Atlas work that we did on, on um, bronchi, the, these, these large uh, generations of the, the airways in the lung, and, and also alveoli, the, the parenchyma mapping, which is uh, down uh, inside where there are the small generations um, of, the, of the airways in the lung. And we compared the healthy reference data to bronchoscopy data from, from asthmatic donors, from asthmatic patients. And um, of course, in asthma, basically, the, the, um, there's inflammation that leads to thickening of the, of the muscles and ultimately an asthmatic attack. And the approach that we took here was to, um, to use um, bronchoscopies from, that were carried out in collaboration with, with our partners in Groningen in the Netherlands, um, Martijn Nawin and, and Martin van der Berger. And, and these are bronchoscopy samples from living donors and then parenchyma from deceased transplant donors, from the deceased transplant donor program. And used uh, now, I want to focus on suspension cell data um, from, from microfluidic droplets, single cell RNA sequencing. So this is different technology from what you saw before, which allowed us to unravel uh, the different decipher the different cell populations in the two different tissues of the lung. So the um, and and the tissue architectures in these locations are really quite different, as are the cell populations. So you've got the the type one, type two alveolar cells in the parenchyma, whereas these um, goblet and ciliated cell populations are are epithelial cells in the in the larger uh, gen generations of the the lung. And as part of this work, we also profiled um, the upper airways, in other words, the nose from, from a small number, only two donors. And um, I, I want to emphasize this because I'm going to come back to this. Um, and, and what we found was two different goblet cell populations in addition to the ciliated cell populations. And those two different goblet cell populations uh, included one population that you can see highlighted here um, that that is has a more kind of um, activated innate immune signature um, that in, implies that it's likely to interact with dendritic cells, T cells, and so on. And it later we later realized that this goblet cell population also has a much higher ACE2 expression level, which then became relevant in the context of SARS-CoV-2 and the the SARS-CoV-2 receptor. Um, just sort of backtracking to the asthma study for a minute, um, what, what I want to uh, mention very quickly again was that in this collaborative work with our colleagues in the Netherlands and in Germany and at GSK, we found that the, um, the asthmatic donors had a, a, a sort of aberrant pattern of ep epithelial cells in the bronchi. And they also had very specific T cell subpopulations. And those specific T cell populations um, pose basically potential targets for, for novel drugs in asthma that aren't, that aren't uh, particularly in patients that aren't steroid responsive. Um, so I'm going to use that to seg over into um, the final story of this talk, which is going to be on uh, COVID-19, as, as Colin mentioned at the very beginning. And so, as I mentioned in this, in this work where we were primarily interrogating asthmatic versus healthy donors, the, the data from the nasal cavity showed this goblet cell population with high ACE2 expression. And, um, and, and we discussed it very generally in the paper, mostly, mostly in the supplementary material. Um, but then, of course, earlier this year, when the, the pandemic kind of hit us very, very rapidly, um, we went back to, to our uh, airway data and asked, where is, is the SARS-CoV-2 receptor expressed? In which cells it expressed? And can we generate hypotheses about where the coronavirus might be docking in terms of the tissues in our body? In, the, in those very early stages of infection um, when the virus is entering. And that's relevant for the airways, it's also relevant for other barrier tissues. And this became um, 
a, a brilliant collaborative project uh, across the, the a very broad swathe of the human cellulose community that even even includes Colin um, uh, by chance who, who introduced me and um, that's one of the great things about the human cell atlas is that it's 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 a large community but it's a really small world and um, what we were able to do then gathering all of the published data from this human cell atlas, but also unpublished data that people incredibly generously shared including the cornea and, and the conjunctiva the eye tissue um, but also liver and, and heart and other tissues. People were very, you know, in this exceptional situation where speed is of the essence and science is part of the solution out of this pandemic, the, the collaborative spirit has just been um, incredibly encouraging that, it, that, it, that it's, it's catalyzed. And um, what we ask basically in all these tissues is where is uh, the receptor expressed? And, and Ward and Songnak and Ni Huang in my group went about um, interrogating different tissue data sets in a systematic manner. And um, I'm going to start with the nose again, where I told you about that goblet population that has that is that's really high in the ACE2, but also the ciliated cells, kind of as previously expected, express the receptor. Um, and of course, the, the nose is really relevant in terms of those early phases of um, viral entry and uh, the understanding mechanistically the high transmissivity of this virus as compared to other viruses. In the lungs, we've got club in the lower areas, club and ciliated cells that express the receptor. And then down in the alveoli, in the lower parenchymal tissue of the lung, the alveolar type two cell, which was the, the first cell that was described using antibodies and immunohistochemistry as expressing um, the receptor in 2004. As I mentioned, Linda Lako's group uh, um, uh, shared the um, ACE2 expression profile of her unpublished eye data. And what this revealed was that there are superficial conjunctival cells in the conjunctiva, so the whites of your eye um, that express have, have high levels of ACE2 and Tempras2, the protease that goes along with, with stripping the the surface of the virus and allowing viral entry. And then in the in the cornea, there are also uh, corneal epithelial cells that, that have good levels of expression of ACE2. And that um, understanding that is, is in, uh, of course, the, the eye connects the nose and it implicates the um, nasolacrimal duct as a, a mechanism of infection and transmission. Other barrier tissues where the virus could be passing through is the, the gastrointestinal tract, basically starting in the mouth and, and going down to the rectum and in the ileum, the small intestine, there are enterocytes um, that have high levels of ACE2 expression. And um, I also want to want to mention that there are cells in the placenta, both perivascular cells and also fibroblast populations that do express ACE2. And this may be potentially relevant in understanding vertical transmission from um, uh, maternal to fetal uh, uh, transmission of, of the virus. It's very rare that that happens, but um, this could, could help understand the mechanisms that may be involved in maternal fetal transmission. And so um, with that, basically I've taken you through a tour of um, different diseases where human cellless data has provided insights into mechanisms. So I've mentioned um, uh, the, uh, the, the asthma example and COVID-19, but, but I also went to the NK cells, which are known, the NK cell extravillous trophoblast interaction, which is known to be um, uh, involved in incompatibility between maternal and paternal alleles, accounting for 13% of, of um, preeclampsias and miscarriages. Um, and and um, understanding the details of which cells are involved and what are their expression patterns is important in um, understanding and then ultimately also addressing and treating diseases. And so um, uh, I, I focused on the, the airways to some extent and also the, uh, the uterus. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you for listening and I'll be happy to take questions.
Oh, thank you very much, Sarah. So I know it's, it's particularly difficult to be sat in your in your front room or whatever talking to an audience. It's it's not a particularly easy thing to do. I, I know we're all having to get used to it. So uh, a, a very uh, detailed presentation about the value of the human cell atlas. So it's some obviously some specific applications. So so we do have a number of uh, uh, questions as we thought we probably would and I'll kind of go through them as I can find them. So I'm gonna have to peer down at my laptop to be able to read them, sorry. Um, so so really the, um, the first question um, uh, that has come from some uh, Catherine McInnes, which basically asks, is it possible using the single cell RNA-seq approach to um, uh, resolve different uh, transcript isoforms for genes. Obviously, many genes are alternatively spliced. So, do you have the read depth to do that? For RNA um, sorry, for full length protocols, yes. And there are a couple of different full length protocols. So, um, um, the SmartSeq was the original one from Richard Sandberg, and then SmartSeq 2, which is a, a variant thereof. Um, we, we've published an um, related protocol that uses a different set of enzymes, NEB enzymes, that we've put on protocols.io and submitted for publication. The challenge for those protocols is throughput uh, for those full-length protocols, and um, that's why we've we've published um, an automation workflow. Uh, if, if it's by Lior Mamanova and my group, and it's up on protocols.io. Okay, thank you. So, very light robotics that are that are inexpensive. Right. Okay. So, thank you. So, the the second question really uh, from Dylan Voss sort of relates, I guess, to the to the to the first question as well, which is, what what are the limitations with sort of sequence read depth and single cell sequencing, and and uh, are you comfortable that you can get a complete transcriptome of each individual cell or representation of each individual Visual cell. So the um, there's there isn't a, a one single answer to that. So it depends a lot on the protocol. So we've talked about uh, SmartSeq, NEB full length RNA sequencing uh, just now in the previous question, and and then my talk I presented a lot of data based on 10x genomics droplet microfluidic data, and each protocol in a read depth dependent manner. Uh, varies in sensitivity, and so I would say the you know one of the most sensitive ones are SmartSeq, that full-length protocol uh, with a, a saturating read depth, and you can get down into the single digits of de de detection sensitivity using that approach. So you can detect on the order of one to ten molecules of mRNA per cell. However, throughput is limiting, um, and so. The, the droplet microfluidics protocols are more widely adopted and used um, because of that, and and they're they're less sensitive. But the the, the benefit is the um, the larger numbers of cells. So um, yeah, it really depends on the protocol. And and one way of addressing the sensitivity question is is for instance by by integration or deconvolution of bulk data with single cell. Um, but but yeah, it it, it 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 can be an issue depending on your research question. For instance, if you mm -hmm. want to focus on very very lowly expressed transcription factors or something like that. Yeah, and I, and I, I guess the sort of the the consequence of that is that's particularly difficult in very rare cell populations. So obviously you're aware of the way that the single cell single cell work has kind of redefined the airway epithelial cell population. So I guess if you've got a particularly rare cell rare cell type within a within a tissue then it's going to be difficult to completely gauge the transcriptome of that cell um well unless you enrich and then dig drill in you know with a full length highly sensitive method for instance so you'd have to do it in an iterative way you'd have to discover with a a, a large breadth method and then drill in you know in a second stage okay thank you method. yeah so, the next question we have from uh, Anne Harris is uh, com very complimentary about your endometrial work, which I think you've told us is just about uh, was just been submitted. So, um, so uh, are there uh, cells that are shared in common with other epithelial cells? You you referred to the ciliated cells. 
And does the, the human cell atlas project have a kind of comparative bioinformatic analysis that will allow you to uh, study the interaction between these different cell types and tissues from a sort of an evolutionary perspective? Okay. There's, so there's lots of different questions. I've got a question there, actually. Um, so that, so I, I see two questions within that question. One is um, comparing epithelial cells across different tissues of the human body. And, um, you know, we've done some in our BBKNN batch effect regression paper published in Bioinformatics not too long ago. Um, we, we did a, a, a sort of um, overarching view of mouse cells and the epithelial cells are actually amongst the most different of the different cell lineage. So, so immune cells, vasculature, fibroblasts and so on, the, the, the populations are slightly different in the different tissues. They adapt, they have kind of different variations according to the tissue, but overall they're pretty similar. Epithelial cells, which often form kind of the functional heart of the tissue, if you will, they they tend to be really, really specific to that tissue. So yes, I, you're, you're right that I mentioned secretory and ciliated cells in the endometrium and, and goblet and ciliated cells in, in the airways. Um, but that, that's slightly misleading because they really have very, very different personalities. It's just those gross features, uh, those gross categories that, that, that occur in both tissues. And then the second part, well, okay, I think, I think I see where the question is going. So the second part was on the, um, the evolutionary relationships between cells. And, um, you know, I think that's, or between tissues, I think that's a super, super interesting question. Um, you know, because the, the, the different tissues are so different to each other, one way of addressing that may be to, to make cell atlases of, you know, the whole tree of life, essentially. One day, yeah, yeah, you laugh. I mean, it's, 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 it's a funny idea now. It's a crazy idea, but, you know, the Human Genome Project was completed around 20 years ago. Um, the announcement was exactly 20 years ago this past weekend. And we, we now have the Earth Biogenome Project and the Darwin Tree of Life, which is sequencing all living, living uh, you know, organisms on the planet. And so you could imagine that someday you would have a cell atlas of the tree of life of every living organism on the planet. And that would allow you to to uh, to reconstruct the evolution of cell types in a very accurate way. In the meantime, um, uh, you know, they'll, they'll have to be proxies. Okay. And, and focus on particular. So, so in uh, wishing to generate uh, more work for everybody involved in this project, um, so is there going to be an integration of uh, proteomics with uh, with the transcriptomics? Because of course you can have a a gene and not necessarily a protein. You can't necessarily have a protein without a gene. So, so are, well, are you? The transcript is degraded. Yeah. Okay. At a particular snapshot in time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are uh, proteomics initiatives related to the human cell atlas. So one example is Neil Kelleher, who's part of the HubMap project, which is the NIH-funded counterpart or um, sort of. Uh, allied project to the human cell atlas and there there's um, like proteomic sub projects and eventually the idea is to systematically purify you know we've talked about purifying rare cell populations systematically purify um, cell populations from from tissue cell populations that are discovered by the human cell atlas and then uh, get enough of them to do proteomics because of course the challenge with proteomics at the moment the reason that it's not the method of choice for the human cell atlas is that the, the the unbiased proteomics requires a good amount of cells as input material. It's not single cell, it's you're talking thousands really. So um, that's yeah, obviously obviously it's 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 pretty difficult with the sensitivity. So so uh We've got a couple of shorter questions, which may have longer answers, of course. But um, so, have you been able to detect mitochondrial transcripts in the single cell systems? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, the answer is yes to both mitochondrial transcripts. Uh, so they're mostly mostly mitochondrial mitochondrial transcripts of nuclear origin. 
Um, I don't know whether they mean mitochondrial transcripts of nuclear origin or mitochondrial transcripts of mitochondrial origin. Um, right. but, but I mean, there's some detection of both. Um, and the the mitochondrial transcripts of nuclear origin, or, you know, the the the, the primers are poly uh, poly poly a tail primers. Right. So the transcripts um, that that have a poly a track will be um, will be detected preferentially. And but there's always a good fraction of mitochondrial transcripts that are detected. And uh, uh, as you may be aware, an excess of mitochondrial transcripts is often used as a proxy of a low quality or apoptotic cell um, of cell debris or of a cell that has a, a, perm a permeabilized plasma membrane and that's leaking cytosolic transcripts and is enriched in, in, in transcripts that are mitochondrial inside the mitochondria and more protected. So the answer is yes to both types of transcripts. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay. and short question, longer answer. And then so, and another short question. So is, is ACE2 overexpressed in asthmatic tissue? I'm sure the answer's in the papers. But. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question, but the, you know, the funny thing was we weren't focusing on that in that paper, of course, because that, that sort of came later, um, that analysis. I mean, what... Um, ACE2 does come up, as I mentioned, kind of with a with that immune activation signature that I focused on in the nose, but it does also happen in the bronchi, and um, uh, that that there is that co-expressed module of genes, and in fact, it, it also in the gut, and um, and that module is more common, you know, loosely put under stressed conditions. So my, my gut feeling is that, that the answer will be yes, but I have to go back and double check. Okay. It also increases with aging and so on. Yeah. So uh, another short question, which has probably got an incredibly long answer is, have you had any unexpected results? I would say, you know, there are surprises. Uh, every experiment opens up, so, you know, new surprises. And every tissue has sort of unexpected new cell types. And I think that's one of the, you know, incredibly exciting and gratifying things of working on this, on this project. And, and it's, it's, I think the whole community really enjoys that, those unexpected new discoveries. And it's the, the power of this high resolution technologies. Um, you know, I want to, I want to emphasize that it's, it's thanks to the, to the, you know, incredible uh, revolution in these transcriptomic technologies in terms of high resolution, spatial resolution, and so on, that's enabling us to make these discoveries. Yeah, so, no, yeah. I guess a good example really is, is the work that came out a couple of years ago, I, identifying the ionocytes in the airway. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, so that's, that's a I mean, clearing. So that's, that's, that's a tissue that's been, you know, Studied to, for decades, you know, for decades, using microscopy. The endometrium, you know, to me, the decidua, that that paper, you know, um, um, that really ripped open the zonated architecture of the the decidua, the the pregnant form of the endometrium. I mean, that was full of surprises. You know, it's been cited hundreds of times in, in a very short period of time, because the it, it was known that there are, that there are different layers in the in the endometrium, like in our skin, and I mentioned those different layers. But the cells that compose the different layers were pretty much a mystery, and it's that the single cell transcriptomics and you know the the fact that we were able to access the tissues and then um, mm -hmm. study them with these technologies that completely you know switched on. It was like switching on a light bulb, I think, in a way, in terms of explaining. The, the detailed cell populations and, and molecular expression patterns of them and so on. So. Okay, thank you. So, so I think in the interest of time, we'll just have one last question, if that's okay. And, yeah. and it goes back to the, the first part of your talk, which is the spatial transcriptomics. And uh, the question says, how do you resolve small cells that are close together um, relative to, uh, uh, so you have RNA from multiple different cells? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I went over that very quickly because I was just trying to cover a lot of things. So the only way to do it is computationally to get to a pseudo single cell resolution from the data in that spot through deconvolution 
Right. And what okay. we used was this Bayesian model called Cell to Location that's on GitHub by Vitaly Kotrevnikov in, in my program from Almaty Arctic School. And um, and Vitaly is a, a, a brilliant student who developed that. There are there are other deconvolution methods that can be applied too. So it's only through the integration of the yeah. the, the two different data sets that you get to the quasi single cell resolution. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So, so obviously, I think you alluded to it before how how rapidly the technology is changing here. So maybe in a short space of time, some of those uh, difficult spatial uh, questions will be more easy to address, perhaps. Yeah, um, absolutely. We're counting yeah. on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Right. So, thank you very much, sir. Fantastic presentation. So, I'd I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Biochemical Society for for the presentation and uh, for answering the questions that that have come in. So. Um, so I'd like to say to, to the audience in general that the Biochemical Society are running these uh, webinars uh, 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 on demand, uh, on suggestion. So if anybody has suggestion for uh, future speakers, then please contact the, uh, the events office and they will be able to consider those. Obviously, some of our lectures are very specifically at the moment uh, filled by our awardees and I think the, our next one will be that in uh, next week I believe but uh, in general we're we're open to uh, suggestions and offers so uh, again thank you for all attending thank you Sarah for your presentation and um, thank you very much thank you